Thank you very much, Amy, for the generous introduction. Thank you for also not sharing pictures or anything else uh, from the PhD student years, though I have nothing to hide from those years, of course. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed being a Tippy PhD student, and it's just an, uh, an honor of a lifetime to come back now as a professor and to serve in, the, in, in that capacity as well as in the capacity as Director of Executive Education. So thank you so much for the welcome today. I'm thrilled to talk about a subject that is not based on my own super Supervisor, just to give that caveat as well. Um, and so I, but a topic nevertheless that holds import for many different people. Um, and I hope that I can uh, be able to share effectively just some of the insights uh, gained from some of my research and other people's research on it. Now, Amy mentioned in my bio about my children. I am the proud parent of four children. They range in age from 15 all the way down to five. And a few years ago, when my daughter, who just turned 12 yesterday and is in sixth grade, was when she was in first grade, she invited me, rather she begged me, I should say, and I cannot still figure out to this day why, to come to her career day in her first grade class. Now, uh, she's my daughter, and so she can pretty much get me to do anything that she wants to. And so I did, agreed, and I said, yes, I would. Um, I was hesitant to do this. In fact, I was more nervous for this experience than any kind of executive audience that I've ever been in front of, no matter how hard-nosed executives the, the, the group might be. It was terrifying to me. Have you ever heard of a first grader who stands up in class and says, I want to be a professor of organizational behavior someday? Nobody does that. I didn't do that as a first grader. So how am I supposed to explain this to a group of first graders? But she twisted my arm and I, and I, and I came. So here's a picture that I have presented here of me actually presenting that day in the first grade class. I came in jeans and a tweed jacket just to try to play the stereotypical part as much as I possibly could. And when I came into the class, I started telling the kids at the time I was working for Texas A&M University, as, as Amy mentioned, and I said that I'm a professor at Texas A&M. Now, naturally, what they really wanted to talk about was Texas A&M football, which I could talk about all day. I can talk even more about Hawkeye football, go Hawks. So I, I, I entertained them a little bit with that. I was actually teaching the starting quarterback at the time, who was a very immensely popular young man in the community. That's probably the only thing they remember from the experience, frankly. But after kind of doing that discussion, I tried to, tried to get down to business. And I said, let me tell you what I do. And I just decided to throw this out because I didn't know what else to say to this group. By the way, as an aside, I was following a firefighter and a photographer, the professions that my kids think are cool. And then in walks the rather uncool business professor. And so I threw this out and I said, what I do is I teach students, college students, how not to be bad bosses. And I just threw that out and waited for a response. And it did not take more than two seconds for half the kids in class to raise their hand and start telling me, my mom has a bad boss or my dad hates his boss. And what I was so nervous for ended up being a really engaging discussion with these first graders about their moms and dads, bad bosses, to the point I really left exhilarated from the experience. We get into a lot of depth about what they were hearing about their moms and dads, bad bosses. And I never knew at that point that I could be maybe not as cool, but at least not as, un, not as uncool as I thought I was, but maybe not as cool as a photographer and the, uh, and, and, and the uh, firefighter. But I left that experience and I reflected on it quite a bit. And I came to what I would say are three conclusions from that, from that particular experience. First conclusion, which is helpful for me as a parent in particular, is that first graders have underdeveloped filters. And so that was one thing certainly that I learned from that. So when you're at the dinner table and you're talking about bad bosses, it's coming in one ear and it's going straight out the mouth with no filter in between. So I definitely learned that. And that was a good, a good parenting lesson. But here's what's fascinating about the experience. When I tried to get them to talk about good bosses their parents had, I got very little response back. They were very much able to classify and talk about bad bosses than they were good bosses. Now, as psychologists have known for a long time that negative images and anecdotes stick in your head a lot longer than do positive images. So it certainly fits with that perspective there. But it was just fascinating that they were mostly talking about bad bosses that their, that their uh, parents had encountered and worked for. But the other thought besides that, those two conclusions, the underdeveloped fillers, uh, filters and that 
we focus more on bad bosses than probably good bosses in our everyday conversations is I thought about these bosses that these kids were describing. And I concluded that at least I guess I hypothesized that none of these bosses probably came to work on their first day in the managerial role and said, I hope I'm a bad enough boss that one of the first grade son, sons and daughters or of one of my employees will tell a complete stranger about me. But the fact is, is that it happened and it happens. So it led to a lot of different questions that I'm going to address today. But let's start with addressing just this question, this notion that we tend to focus more on the bad bosses than the good bosses in our everyday conversations. Is that just our way of, of, of conversing or is there something deeper to that? Let me show you some data to suggest that maybe it goes deeper than just dinner conversations at the dinner table. Two surveys that I think are very informative in that regard come from leading uh, global consulting firms. One of them is DDI, and they did a project called the Frontline Leadership Project back in 2019. And essentially what they did is they surveyed over a thousand managers, senior leaders, and individual contributors to be able to figure out why the extent to which the participants quit because of a manager. Turns out from their survey that 43% of people left at least one company to because of a bad manager, 14% left multiple companies because of bad managers, which means 57% of the total sample had left a job or multiple jobs simply because of a bad manager. But more than that, 32% had thought about leaving a company or were currently thinking about leaving a company because of their manager. So in total, 88% of respondents in this survey said they either were, were thinking about leaving or had left or had left multiple jobs because of their manager. Now, why is that? Well, Corn Ferry sur uh, survey from back in 2018, where they surveyed well over 2,000 people across different industries, where they, and, and, and in this survey, they measured a number of different things that might influence people to switch their jobs. The, and, 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 and that actually would also cause primarily work stress. Things like changes in technology or, or being overloaded with work or conflicts with coworkers. 35% of respondents, which was the highest factor here, indicated that the number one source of work stress for them was their boss. So yes, we talk about bad bosses anecdotally, I think over the dinner table, even in a first grade setting, but it goes much deeper than that too. It kind of fits, this, these statistics fit the old saying that people don't quit companies, largely they quit bosses. Now, as we talk about bad bosses, there's a lot of different ways to capture that and a lot of different behaviors that fall under what we might call bad leadership. Sometimes leaders are poor communicators, like we oftentimes see in the Dilbert comic, where they may not know they're supposed to do a task because it was never really communicated to them. Sometimes people feel that their bosses are not good because there's a lack of recognition. One really particularly alarming survey from a number of years ago indicated that 50% of the respondents in this particular survey had not received, in their view, a sincere thank you from the boss in over a year. So sometimes a lack of recognition can be an indicator uh, of, of bad leadership. Sometimes Unreasonable expectations held by the leader are a reason why we might say that someone is a bad boss. What's interesting, by the way, when it comes to unreasonable expectations is that in the Corn Ferry survey, it's not just the people are trying to get out of work. In fact, in the Corn Ferry survey, they found that people were more stressed by being underworked than by overworked. But people were particularly stressed when they were overworked and the compensation or other rewards and recognition did not match that. So again, when we say unreasonable expectations, it's not just that, we're, uh, that people want to do less work, it's that people are comfortable taking on more work if the expectations match the rewards and recognition and pay for it. And finally, there's of course the ever, ever pervasive sometimes and, and, and infamous micromanagers too. Each of these can be indicators of bad leadership. But the title of this session today is not bad leadership, it's toxic leadership. Let me disentangle for a minute toxic leadership from bad leadership, at least is how it's been defined in the research that I and others have done on this topic.
when we talk about toxic leadership, it's much more personal. If you notice the bad leadership, a lot of those are around tasks. You're not communicating well. Maybe you're not recognizing people for the work they've done. We're not uh, giving reasonable expectations. We're micromanaging the task. But with toxic leadership, it's much more relationship focused and much more personal in nature. Things, for example, like stealing credit or public shaming, angry tirades, where it seems that bosses may have temper tantrums in the workplace or even personal insults as well. It's these kinds of behaviors that are more relationship focused in nature that are really what we classify as toxic leadership. And unfortunately, surveys indicate that anywhere from about 15 to 30% of the North American workforce has bosses or has encountered bosses that exhibit these kinds of toxic behaviors. So I thought it'd be useful to disentangle toxic from bad leadership. But then let's ask another question here. Okay, so 14 to 13, 15 to 30 percent of people face toxic boss behaviors. And the best behaviors that we looked at before seem to be toxic, but are they really, do they really have negative effects? Or we're talking about grown men and women here. Can't they handle that kind of behavior? Why should we be so alarmist about this? Well, see for yourself, as I show you this slide here about what the vast body of research on toxic leadership shows are some of the outcomes of those kinds of behaviors I showed you before. What the research overwhelmingly shows is that employees of toxic bosses have lower productivity, lower job attitudes, such as satisfaction and commitment. They also tend to help their coworkers less. They perceive the work environment as less fair, and they actually re report high. They, they have higher, I should say that's higher, somatic uh, health complaints. Now, along those lines, there's also a host of other negative outcomes uh, associated with toxic leadership. Employees report higher stress and burnout. They report more of what we call deviant work behavior. That's things like stealing from the company or sabotaging the boss or the organization. But then we see that the effects of toxic leadership extend well beyond just the workplace and into people's personal and family lives. We find, for example, in the research that victims of toxic leadership tend to be, have greater susceptibility toward alcoholism and abusing family members. We'll talk about that in just a little bit, too. They tend to have higher, these organizations tend to have higher healthcare costs as a result of the uh, somatic health complaints and the stress and burnout that, super, that, that uh, employees experience as a result of toxic leadership. One really interesting study done by some researchers in Sweden over a 10 year period on about 3000 men showed that toxic bosses increased participants rates of heart disease by 25%. And that this worsened all the uh, over time, all the way up to about 64% greater risk for heart disease if someone worked for a toxic boss for more than four years. If you look at these outcomes, you can see that toxic leadership is not just confined to one context, but it spreads like a virus. It spreads in the fact that we don't help each other as much when we are victims of a toxic boss behavior. We actually tend to deviate uh, more um, in terms of our of theft and sabotage of coworkers and others in the organization. And one of my one of my colleagues in the field at University of Pretoria in, in, in uh, Europe, uh, Jennifer Hubler, talks about some of her research on this topic topic is she says it's it's a little bit like the kick the dog phenomenon you have a very rough day at work because your boss just yelled at you you're reeling from it you get return home and the dog is excited to see you and jumps on you and then out of sheer frustration you may even kick the dog now that seems a little extreme to do that turns out from research that's a lot of what happens that that's one of the outcomes of toxic boss behavior only it may not be a dog it can sometimes be a child or it can be a spouse. Really negative outcomes of toxic leadership, so much so that the leading authority, so to speak, his name is Ben Tepper at Ohio State, has classified this as, what, as, as a significant social problem. Now, I suppose for this reason, there's a lot of books that have been written about toxic leadership, not nearly as much as on positive leadership, but enough. And here's just a few examples here. And I suppose that because this topic holds uh, such import for many of us, and maybe because, because some of you have experienced toxic leadership for yourself, 
maybe that's one of the reasons why you're tuning in today. Now, there is a plethora of different, uh, uh, di different resources out there for you to look at should you be experiencing this kind, of, this, this, this kind of occurrence in the workplace. But let me be so blunt as to suggest that while these books can be helpful in gathering anecdotes and some suggestions about how to deal with bad bosses, usually these resources miss out on two things. One of them is that oftentimes they are based purely on cases and anecdotes rather than looking at the large body of empirical evidence on thousands and thousands of bad bosses and managers, toxic leaders, to be able to uncover some, some uh, general findings uh, about what the effects are of these bosses as well as the root causes. And that kind of gets me to the second thing that many of these books leave out. So much of the time, and you can see it in the titles here in these books, is that the books focus on surviving or tangling with or taming or even thriving when you're working for an abusive or for a toxic leader. But to really fix this problem, we really need to get at the root of it. What's causing leaders to be toxic in their behavior? And the problem I have, uh, particularly with some of, the, some of the other sort of popular literature on this, is that it doesn't address that question enough. And in that sense, researchers like me who do address topics around topic, uh, questions around toxic leadership, sort of think of ourselves much like a doctor might think of themselves. When a doctor goes and is inspecting somebody and, 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 and uh, you know, who's experiencing a number of different symptoms, they don't want to just treat the symptoms. They want to try to drill down to what's causing the symptoms because then it's going to resolve the symptoms. We kind of do the same thing as researchers too. We want to figure out what it's at, what's at the root of toxic leadership so that we can make some broad recommendations for how organizations and individuals can really put an end to it, not just tame or deal with it or even survive. I guess what I would say is that our goal, that my goal anyway with the research is a little higher than that. And so with that in mind, the title of this topic, talk is not only just about toxic leadership, but why it happens and how we can stop it. Now, in that regard, what I'm going to do is I'm going to present to you some different things, some different assumptions that we might have about why toxic leadership happens. And I might present, and I'm going to present to you some things that really the research shows are the primary causes of it. Some of my research and some others' research that I'm, that I'm, that I'm uh, very familiar with. What I hope by the end is we have a good understanding of what the root causes are of this behavior. So as we lead organizations or as we lead ourselves, that we can put an end to it and eradicate it. Now, in that regard, let me address one of the biggest assumptions that people often have, myself included, before going into this research about why leaders are toxic. It relates to this, which is probably my favorite far side comic of all time. Oftentimes, we just think that there is these set of jerks that have just been placed on the earth by a creator, and that these jerks are wreaking havoc, or in other words, kind of fit this comic that it's just making life a little interesting, and that's putting it lightly, obviously. When, I, when you see this comic, again, what I want you to think about is that a lot of times what we assume is that we think that people are predisposed to being the kind of bosses that we're talking about now, the toxic leaders. And in other words, that people possess certain genetically based traits or have certain experiences in life that make them build their traits that they then uh, engage more naturally in these behaviors. However, in a large scale study done where it's called a meta-analysis where they accumulated dozens of different studies on toxic leadership to find out what are its primary root causes. What was interesting in that study was that none of the dominant personality traits that psychologists study had even a moderate correlation with abusive supervision. Now, a few what we might call dark side personality traits did. For example, narcissism had a moderate size correlation with, with toxic leadership. A personality trait, a dark side personality trait that psychologists often study called Machiavellianism, which is a propensity to always think that the means justify, that the ends justify the means, was also moderately correlated. But they weren't nearly as correlated as other factors. <laughs> 
In other words, it's not to suggest that traits don't play a role and that some people are just naturally going to be more toxic leaders. It's just not the whole story. And in fact, is a very minor part of the story. Instead, I want you to think back to my first grade experience there. Think back to the bosses. Again, half the kids in class raised their hand and told me about something that their mom or dad's boss did. I doubt that most of the, uh, the half of those were narcissists just looking at the data on how many people are actually high on narcissism in society, or were all Machia Machiavellians, again, looking at the data at how many people are high on Machiavellianism in society. Instead, it seems that perhaps bosses can be unwittingly toxic, that we may not even realize it, and in essence, that all of us including me, may be susceptible to becoming toxic leaders and perhaps be even largely unaware of it. Let me demonstrate this for you by talking about some studies that have looked at three major root causes of toxic boss behavior. Root causes that look at situations and cognitions and at emotions that each of us can experience and therefore that make each of us susceptible to being toxic bosses. They are tolerance for it in the workplace, and so the environment itself, the feeling of psychological power, and then drained emotional and cognitive resources. Bottom line with all of these is we're all capable of it, and so as we understand these root causes, we can both stop it in ourselves, and then we can figure out ways for the organization to be able to frame the, craft the environment and other things to be able to root out this particular, to root out toxic leadership. Let's talk about first tolerance for it in the workplace. A few years ago, some colleagues and I here at the University of Iowa, this is when I was a PhD student here at the University of Iowa, we conducted a study to see why abusive supervisors may be tolerated at work and sometimes even rewarded for their behavior. So we conducted a really simple experiment. What we did was we created a fictitious newspaper article that featured a fictitious CEO of a company. We named him Michael Eastman. And we wrote the article to feature some of his toxic behavior. He would yell at be, and berate employees constantly, tell them their work was a quality of a second grader, uh, and do all sorts of other things that we talked about earlier about public shaming, about credit stealing, about personal insults, and those kinds of toxic behaviors. Now, after featuring this CEO in this fictitious newspaper article, we then talked about the company's performance under the leadership of this so-called Michael Eastman. And what we did was we simply just showed and we varied it across different participants in the study. Some participants saw that the company was wildly successful. That's captured in the high outcomes graph you can see there. In essence, that the stock price of the company that Eastman was leading was, was gaining relative to its competitors and its, in its industry. Versus other participants, half the other participants received a scenario where the company was, was definitely decreasing in stock price relative to its competitors. And then what we did was we asked participants to indicate whether they would renew Michael Eastman's contract. And we wrote the article to reflect that his contract was up for renewal CEO. And then we asked them a series of open-ended questions just to kind of get their thoughts and feelings about Michael Eastman as a CEO. Look at the different results and the different both qualitative as well as the quantitative data that we collect as we vary, as, as, as we did this study. Again, only varying, not the behavior, just the outcomes. In the high outcomes condition where the stock price raised relative to its competitors, here's some of the comments that people offered about Michael Eastman. He has a different personality than we're used to. He just wants to get the best out of people. He tells it how it is. Grown men and women can handle such remarks. If the firm's successful, what's the big deal? The employees are better because of his toughness, and he's just a perfectionist. And in this condition, 66% of participants recommended that Eastman's contract be renewed. Now, I'm going to show you the low outcomes condition and how they thought about Michael Eastman. And again, we didn't vary the behavior. We just varied the outcomes. Participants remarked, He's a horrible CEO. 
He's unprofessional and rude to his employees. He's an idiot. The guy's a jerk and needs to be replaced. They need to get rid of him. The article, the CEO in the article is insane. And maybe my favorite, he needs an anger management class. Only 12% of participants recommended that Eastman's contract be renewed. Now, as we dug into the data further and have done some follow-up studies on this, we've come to a conclusion. The conclusion is, is that oftentimes abusive supervision or toxic leadership is tolerated if not only, well, it's certainly tolerated when they, when they get the outcomes that shareholders and others want, but that this is more than just an ends justify the means mentality. What we do as individuals is we reframe the behavior of the toxic leader from something that really is toxic or horrible, as it says, or is jerkish or is insane to actually a more moral behavior. He's a perfectionist. He's just trying to get the best out of his employees, those kinds of comments. And so basically we can tolerate this behavior because we reframe the behavior if there's some outcome that, that we see as good or that we associate with that leadership. Now, what's fascinating about this is we didn't put the participants in the role as shareholders. And so they had no stake in this at all. And yet they still recommended that they still basically focused or anchored on his performance rather than his behavior. Tolerance for it in the workplace, therefore, can be one reason why abusive supervision, toxic leadership can be perpetuated in organizations. Now, that said, most people still, even then, if you're just looking objectively at behavior and you're not taking into account the performance of the supervisor, usually object to abusive forms of leadership or toxic forms of leadership as rather immoral. However, what we often find in organizations who continue to permit this behavior is that sometimes we give it a pass because the supervisor seems very contrite after a particular blow up. Well, he feels sorry for it, and so we'll, we'll let it slide this time. Well, my colleagues and I were fascinated in this particular phenomenon, made even more fascinated by when I read the book Leadership by Doris Kearns Goodwin, which profiled a number of different U.S. presidents, including Lyndon B. Johnson. I was fascinated by an anecdote in there shared by his press secretary, George Reedy, who was a longtime aide, worked for him for over 15 years. George Reedy wrote in a, in a memoir about how Johnson's cruelty extended even to people who had virtually walked the last mile for him. But it seems that whenever Reedy considered resigning, Johnson would show up with some kind of a, a lavish gift or something else that made it so that Reedy would forget the grievances, essentially, and keep working for Johnson. But that didn't stop the behavior. And in fact, Johnson's behavior really just escalated toward Reedy over the 15 years that they worked together. I was fascinated by this phenomenon. And, my, and, and, and so my colleagues and I decided to say, let's explain this phenomenon and unpack it a little bit more. Is this potentially one reason why supervisor, abusive supervisors are tolerated in the workplace? Because if they seem sorry for it, then maybe they're tolerated for it. Our major question was, are they really sorry for it? Or is it sort of a facade going with the Lyndon B. Johnson example? And so, as we do, we conducted a study. What we did was we surveyed 79 bosses over an online platform. And what we did was we made sure their responses were anonymous so that they could be very candid about their behaviors. And we also surveyed the supervisors themselves uh, going along with some of the research showing that supervisors and others are pretty good, actually it, it, pretty honest judges about this kind of behavior. We did this for, what we did is we surveyed su these su uh, supervisors across a number of different industries. And every day, multiple times per day, we did pulse surveys. And we did this for three weeks in a row. Every morning, the supervisors participating would get a survey inquiring about their behavior the day before and whether they were doing things like calling people incompetent or invading people's privacy or making negative comments about the subordinates in front of others, public shaming again. And at the same time, we asked the supervisors how they felt about their prior day behaviors and how that affected their perceived image for their employees. And then later in that day, we would send another survey where we asked the supervisors to rate 
to, to talk about how they behaved during that day. What we found was that when bosses reported having abused their employees the day before, they viewed it as a threat to their social image. That's what I have pictured here in this kind of boxes narrow model that captures our study. They saw it as a threat to their image, but because they saw it more as a threat to their image rather than kind of a moral uh, breach, then what they did is rather than kind of really engaging in immense making behavior and really try to make nice, what they reported themselves as doing is really faking nice by ingratiating themselves to employees, by engaging in some level of self-promotion, and by trying to uh, try, uh, trying to essentially make themselves um, uh, uh, to, to give an impression that they really were sorry. But bosses actually admitted that these were really just for show. And in fact, what we found is that simultaneously with engaging in these kinds of impression management behaviors, the bosses actually admitted to engaging in more benign forms of toxic leadership, like gossiping behind their subordinates back, for example. Okay, so what do we take from this study here? I wrote an HBR, however, Business Review article about this along with my colleagues and certainly refer you to that for some of the more, uh, so more in-depth about some of the implications. But sometimes we tolerate abusive supervision and toxic forms of leadership because we think that the boss is making nice after a particular tirade. And the bottom line of our study is don't fall for it. What we find in our study, at least, is that this is normally a facade rather than an actual attempt to make nice. The supervisors themselves admit that they're faking nice. So one reason, again, why abusive supervision and why toxic leadership occurs is because the workplace tolerates it, whether because they get the outcomes that we want. And so we reframe the behavior. That was the first study I presented or because we take their, their attempts at contrition and their, and their uh, you know, perceived sorrow for their behavior, and we, and we assume that they're making nice when in fact, most supervisors indicate that they're just faking nice. All right, so all this to say, okay, but what about bosses like Steve Jobs? Um, who was notoriously uh, toxic and abusive towards his employees? Or what about Bobby Knights, one of the most winning coaches in college basketball history? What about them? They were successful. So why, how did they get away with it? And how were they actually successful at it? Again, sometimes the success of, of some abusive supervisors that we even see may actually contribute to why it's a pervasive problem. I love a study done by two people named Jack Zenger and Joseph Folkman, where what they did is that they did a study on 51,000 leaders, and they wanted to find out how many of those leaders could be rated in the top quartile of performance while engaging in leader and behaviors like what we've talked about that didn't make them very likable to employees. And what we found is that in that, what they found is that of those 51,000 employees, 27 of them who were rated in the bottom quartile as far as likability and good leader behaviors were rated in the top quartile in terms of leader effectiveness. That's a one in 2000 chance. So often when I have students say, well, why did this work for Steve Jobs? Why did this work for Bobby Knight? I said, it, maybe it did, but I wouldn't go, I, I would not be comfortable with a one in 2000 odds. And so again, going back to our original question, what are some of the root cause of toxic leadership? Sometimes we overestimate its effectiveness. And hopefully you've seen today that it's actually much less effective than we oftentimes even assume that it might be. And in fact, maybe even more dangerous than we assume that it is. Okay, we've talked about one root cause of toxic leadership and that's tolerance for it in the workplace. We've talked about why that is, why it is often tolerated. We get the outcomes we want, we, we give them a pass if they seem sorry, and we view it in other leaders and think that it will work. Those are some reasons why we might tolerate it in the workplace. But it goes beyond just the tolerance of it. And we might all be environments at some point where that kind of behavior is tolerated and therefore susceptible to it. But let me talk about something that may be even more likely potentially for any of us, and that is feelings of psychological power. <laughs> 
I did not publish this study, but I served as a reviewer of this study. When we do academic research, we go through a blind review process where we have, a, where we have colleagues in the field evaluate the quality of the research in order to get publication in, in some of our top research journals. This was a, a study done by researchers at the University of Maryland. They did a little experiment. What they did is they recruited about 116 different supervisors to participate in a study that lasted for two weeks. And like my study that I told you about, they surveyed uh, different supervisors on a daily basis. But what they did is at the beginning of the day, they would vary the supervisors across two different kinds of conditions. Half of the supervisors one day at the very beginning of the surveys that they would fill out, they would give them a little word puzzle. And the words reflected or revolved around power. So for example, you might get something like this where it says power and you gotta fill in the E or executive, fill in the C, authority, fill in the T, boss, fill in the O. All words associated with some kind of positional power. And then they put half the participants in conditions where they would just do random words and fill those in. And then they would have participants reflect on a recent experience in which they possessed power. After going through this exercise, then what the researchers did was at the end of the day, they asked these folks about what their behavior and how they acted during the day. What they found was that when induced to feel power, by just simple activities like this, just reflecting on power or seeing words or hearing words associated with power, that that would actually lead to more toxic behaviors. A lot of times in the popular press, we see we need to feel powerful, feel powerful. And there's some truth to that, but there's also a danger in it. And the danger here is that as we feel power, we can actually become more toxic. Other research shows that as we feel powerful, that we also don't listen to others. And this is not, this is not structural power, is what I call it. Being a boss, that's just, this does not mean that every boss is abusive, but when we feel powerful and we reflect on power, we're actually more likely to be toxic. So one of the implications of this, just as we might find ourselves in work environments, where the behavior, where toxic behavior can be overlooked, sometimes even rewarded. Sometimes we may find ourselves in positions where we feel powerful because of structural power or because of uh, having more knowledge or experience, whatever it might be. This is not to suggest that feeling powerful all times always leads to toxic behavior, but it is just simply a warning for all of us that psychological power can, if induced, lead to some level of toxic behavior. And it turns out from the research, again, that feelings of psychological power are a major predictor of whether people engage in toxic behaviors. So be careful, be wary of feelings of power is kind of the message from this research for you and me. Now, let me go to a third root cause of toxic leadership, something that brings in some of my research here again too. With this notion that we all might be capable of this kind of behavior, and that's the counterintuitive part of this research here, I think. And that is that all of us can often face, and in fact, I'm sure all of us are, have or are maybe even currently facing drained emotional and cognitive resources due to a number of different factors. Let me talk about two factors that can drain our emotional and cognitive resources and make us more likely to engage in toxic box behavior. I want to start that discussion with a little anecdote of my own. These are pictures of me and my family. This first picture here is of me and our oldest son now, who's 15, during my first year of the PhD program here at Iowa. And then the picture of my family standing in front of the old capitals I graduated back in 2012. As part of our process of completing a PhD, we have to complete the dissertation, which can be a very daunting experience. During my dissertation process, I looked at factors that would influence managers burnout. I was fascinated by what could make managers feel burned out. And as we were look, as I was going through this and we were looking at different workplace factors that cause managers to burn out, I had a committee member who posed an interesting question. And the question was, yeah, okay, so Steve, you've focused on workplace things that make managers feel burned out. You've talked about why that can lead to things like toxic leadership. But can it be stuff outside the family that causes that? 
What if you're having family problems? What if you're going through a divorce? What if you have even something like a sick child? What if you are staying up so late because you're having to take care of family needs that you're just not at your best? Can't that also cause uh, people to feel drained and cause abuse supervision? I was intrigued by the question. I was further intrigued in it when I later read a Wall Street Journal article featuring Stella McCartney, where she talked about her own experience with this. And she said, really, you know, in a very honest, transparent way, I lose it sometimes at work. If I was home late and up early with the kids, I'm not a particularly good colleague at work. Perhaps many of us, if not all of us, can kind of relate to that. Well, I wanted to ask that question. I wanted to say, what is, can family influences or things that happen outside of work actually trigger us to engage in more toxic forms of behavior? We know from a long line of research that what we do at work impacts our family. We talked about that a little bit, even being a victim of toxic leadership can make us hostile in the family. But we tried to flip that question and saying, can things that happen in the family or outside of work sometimes cause us to be toxic leaders. In our study, what we did was we surveyed, we worked with a Fortune 500 organization to look at their supervisors, and we looked at the level of family work conflict, as we called it. In other words, the extent to which family problems and demands interfere with work, and how that influenced leaders' toxic leadership. We did this study with about 175 employees and all of their subordinates over about a four-month period. And what we found is that when supervisors face conflicts between family and work, when their family work, when their family lives and demands are interfering with work, it leaves supervisors feeling depleted. And when they feel depleted, in essence, they engage in more toxic leadership. More on that connection in just a little bit. Now, simultaneously with this, one of my good friends at the University of Washington, Chris Barnes, was conducting a parallel study looking at how sleep or the lack thereof influences our resource depletion or our depletion of cognitive and emotional resources. And they too found that it's not just family problems that are interfering with work that cause that resource depletion, but it's also just the plain and simple, the lack of sleep quantity and quality that lead us to feel depleted in our resources and can influence us to be toxic leadership, uh, to, to, to exhibit toxic leadership. But there's one important caveat in all of this. What we found is just because you're feeling exhausted doesn't mean that we will be toxic leaders. It depends instead on whether the workplace imposes sanctions for this type of toxic leader behavior. If the workplace has external restraints against toxic workplace behavior, then Even if we're exhausted and we're depleted, we're much less likely to engage in it, frankly, for fear of appraisal appraisal or fear of punishment. So it's not just that when these internal restraints that we have over our behavior are weakened because of sleep deprivation or family work conflict, we engage in toxic leadership. But if we have, if our internal restraints are weakened, external restraints can strengthen us in not engaging in toxic leadership. However, if our internal restraints against this kind of leader, against this kind of leader behavior are weakened and the workplace tolerates it, then we can unwittingly become toxic leaders. So let's go back to my first grade experience here. Half the kids in this class raised their hands and talked about their moms and dads, bad bosses, most of many of them toxic bosses. Again, the conclusion I had from this is not only that they stick in our minds, even in the minds of the first grade son or daughter of one of the of one of these leaders victims, but that I am sure none of the bosses came into work that day saying I plan to be a toxic boss. That's my style of leadership. Instead, the root causes of, of, of toxic leadership that have been uncovered in research suggest that any of us are capable of it. And so stopping it begins and ends with each of us. So how do we do that? The first thing, set and enforce clear expectations that this kind of behavior is not tolerated in the workplace. 
That's expectations that we can set jointly with those that we lead. Those are rules and policies that organizations can put in place. There are a number of ways in which to set and enforce clear expectations for ourselves in conjunction with others or for the organization to set and enforce clear expectations. As we found in my research, as if leaders are tolerated because, well, they get the outcomes that we want, or, hey, uh, they seem sorry, or, eh, you know, some leaders are pretty effective at this, then the more we're going to breed this kind of toxic, uh, toxic leader behavior. And so number one way to fix toxic leadership is set and enforce clear expectations. That's something that organizations can do for their employees. That's something we as leaders can do jointly with our employees. The second tip for fixing toxic leadership is think collaboration, not power. Again, going back to that study that my friend did, that, that some of my colleagues did at the University of Maryland there, that very simple prompts about power, thinking about how we've exercised power, feeling powerful, even encountering words or phrases, even hearing things like, well, you're the boss, or hearing things like, you make the call boss, can actually trigger us to feel power and therefore misuse that power. And so rather than thinking about positional power, then having a mindset of collaboration is one way to fix toxic leadership. Mindsets of collaboration inherently assume that there are interdependencies and that our behavior is affected by and affects others. And so having a collaborative mindset is the second broad recommendation for being able to fix toxic leadership behavior. The final one, replenish our resources. Whether that's with a good night's sleep and really prioritizing sleep as my, as my friend Chris Barnes at University of Washington has shown in his studies, or being able to have positive experiences in the family. Prioritizing positive experiences in the family can actually replenish our personal, emotional, and cognitive resources and actually make it less likely that we'll engage in toxic leadership. Organizations can encourage sleep by setting various policies such as cell phone use policies after work hours. Some research done by my colleague, Wendy Boswell, at Texas A&M University has shown very convincingly that such policies have an effect on re replenishing people's resources. We can also, as organizations, help employees to prioritize family time and have positive experiences in the family by being able to have things such as flexible time with family and being able to create a family-friendly work environment. Research shows that those kinds of efforts do, in fact, pay some dividends um, for being able to be able to help employees to replenish the resources through good self-care habits as well as through good family practices. These three things right here, these three broad recommendations are meant to address the root causes of leadership, of toxic leadership behavior. And I hope that this presentation has been helpful to detect what are the root causes, what's behind this pernicious behavior, and what we can do to fix it. I appreciate you tuning in today, and I look forward to some of your questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. We have lots of questions coming in. So thank you to those folks who are submitting them. And we have about seven minutes. So we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, so going back to your Steve Jobs slide and talking about that kind of leadership, one of the question is, um, for toxic leadership, some people might use examples from Whiplash or Steve Jobs to explain that it is not the toxic leadership that causes an employee to turn over. The leadership, the leadership just drives out those who are weak. How should employees react to this action? Should employees just leave the workplace? That's a great question. So what's interesting is the assumption there is that toxic leaders drive out the weak, but what we actually find from research is they actually drive out the highest performers. So one of the things we find is actually higher performers are sometimes some of the most victimized by toxic bosses. And so there's some faulty, there's a faulty assumption there that people might say that, well, this just drives out the weak and we're just gonna retain the strong. In fact, what research shows is it can be the exact opposite. Now, does it drive out lower performers? Yes, in fact, the research shows the lower performers can actually be some of the most victimized as well, but it's not confined to the lower performers. It can also affect higher performers. And so bosses have to be aware that their behavior can affect everybody, not just the so-called weak. So a good one, I think, to follow up to that is that um, you mentioned tolerance for toxic behavior can be part of workplace culture. 
is there any correlation between managers who themselves have toxic bosses displaying that behavior towards their own employees? Absolutely. In fact, there's some really interesting research looking at what we call the social learning phenomenon, which is this notion that when we see abusive behavior of others, we tend to mimic that behavior. This goes back to the early 1950s when a, a psychologist named uh, Albert Bandura was doing studies actually on children and trying to explain child, child aggression. What they would do is they would put children into two different rooms. One experimental room, they would have an adult there and they'd have this blow up doll. And in one room, the adults would treat the blow-up doll with respect. And in the other room, the adult would beat up the blow-up doll. And what they found is that the children in the beat-up blow-up doll condition would do even worse things to the blow-up doll than the adult had done. Albert Bandura showed throughout his career that that was not a phenomenon just confined to children. It was also very reflective of adults. And we have very strong evidence suggesting that one of the reasons why toxic workplaces can be can can perpetuate is because it trickles down all the way down the organization as we mentioned earlier it spreads like a virus and sometimes the tolerance for it can be because it's widely accepted in the organization it's widely practiced so i think you sort of answered a question from ken wall who said how does company culture come into play in toxic leadership do companies define their culture or establish intentional culture and this is a good discussion about culture in general. You know, culture is really, if, as, we, as organizational psychologists define it, it's a set of assumptions that then play into values and then translate into practices. So there's a few assumptions we've already talked about. For example, there can be an underlying assumption around toxic leadership that it's okay, it's if it drives results, that can be an assumption that then drives values. What do we value? We really value just performance over everything else. And so the practices we overlook toxic leadership. We might also have the assumption that if a leader acts sorry for it, that's okay, right? Well, that assumption we hope to challenge in our research, right? This is what we found empirically. And then that can lead to a set of, a set of values and a set of assumptions. So culture play or a set of, a set of practices. Culture plays a hugely fundamental role, but how do you change culture or what starts culture? It's assumptions. And so today, as we've talked about, there's a few misguided assumptions about toxic leadership that I hope we've been able to address today. And it's with assumptions that culture starts. I think this is a good one. And I know we're short on time. There's about three really good ones that I'd love to try and get to. Um, one is as a supervisor, is there a good mechanism for gathering feedback from employees on whether you exhibit any qualities of a toxic leader? So that's a great question. The answer is yes but you have to be willing to hear what they have to say. So one of the things we know from research is that toxic bosses oftentimes they're not willing to hear the voice, right? They're not willing to hear the voice or they're framing their, their, their voice in different ways. So here's my suggestion for you. If you're afraid you might be a toxic boss, an unwitting toxic boss, look for the symptoms first. Are your people turning over? Are they feeling burned out? Are they having health complaints? Is there more turnover absenteeism? The slide that I went through that showed the causes, those are symptoms of this behavior. Look for the symptoms. If you're seeing these symptoms, then start digging in further and have that conversation. But look at the symptoms first. That's what I would suggest. Are there any differences based on gender? Great question. So in the research, we actually have not seen. In fact, one of the assumptions behind this is this is just a male phenomenon. But one of the things we find is in the research, looking at large scale meta analyses, looking at the relationship between gender and abusive supervision, there's not a strong correlation at all. In fact, there's a very weak correlation, meaning that this is not a gender specific phenomenon. Both men and women can engage in this kind of behavior. Um, I think we have time for one more. Sure. <laughs> you know, but um, does deception, deceptive communication or lack of communication impact whether a leader is perceived as toxic? You know, that kind of goes back. It's a good question, too. That goes back to some of the differences between just bad leadership versus toxic leadership. Now, deceptive leadership is a little bit different than that. That's a little bit more nefarious than just poor communication or the lack thereof. Usually, I would put lack of communication as a little bit more of a so-called bad leadership behavior. Nefarious behaviors gets a little bit more toxic, but as we've defined toxic today, 
it's more interpersonal in nature. So nefarious communicate or you know deceptive communication may be more around the task, and that's a terrible leadership behavior. But toxic leadership, as we've talked about now, that's much more interpersonal in nature. And so it's a little bit different, but there are certainly some overlap and similarities. Well, shoot, there were a lot more good questions in the chat, but I know that you're going to share your contact information. So we'll go ahead and wrap up today. But thank you, Steve. And thank you, everyone, for attending the Tippy webinar series presentation on toxic leadership. If you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to Steve directly um, at his information. His information will be shown on the screen. Um, if you enjoyed the programming today and like more customized experiences like this for your organization, then you do need to check out the Tippy Leadership Collaborative, which Steve assists in directing. It is the perfect way to reconnect with your alma mater and access its internationally renowned experts to transform the future of your organization. Quickly, here are three ways you can engage with the TLC, Tippy Learning Collaborative. <laughs> need help developing your people into effective and innovative leaders? Tippy TLC can design a customized executive education program that supports your company's goals and harnesses the expertise that Tippy has. If you have a problem in your organization that's keeping you up at night, the TLC can form collaborative research partnerships where Tippy researchers can help you diagnose and solve those problems. And if you're looking for the right expert to speak at an upcoming event or a conference, we can connect you with engaging faculty and speakers at Tippy that will share their knowledge with employees, just like Steve has done for us today. So visit the TLC website or reach out to Steve to learn how they can help your organiza organization tackle its next big challenge. And so again, thank you everyone for participating today. When the event ends in just a moment, you'll see a quick survey. We'd be grateful if you could share your thoughts and help us make future virtual events even better. On behalf of the Tippy College of Business, thank you for joining us this afternoon and always go Hawks.